Crawford. Hello, welcome back. I hope you've had a safe and happy spring break. If you did go somewhere, please go get your free COVID test. You never know. And if you didn't go somewhere and you just were able to, you know, binge my videos, I'm sorry. But anyway, so uh, I had a pretty decent uh, thing. My, my dad's getting better. I, I took care of him all uh, the summer. I mean, no, sorry, the spring break. My son had surgery. He's actually doing great. He's back at school. So things are going well for me as far as that goes. Even got to go out and do a little gardening in this really good weather. So that being said, um, uh, can somebody ping the chat room, please? I just haven't seen that. There we go. Okay, okay. All right, so if you were here last Wednesday, we did a really good uh, crash course on this section 6.1. And I wanted to draw your attention to three things about section 6.1 before we move to section 6.2. We're also gonna finish section 6.1. We have about three slides left. So energy diagrams, this potential energy versus coordinate diagram is very important. You need to look at this. It tells you so much about the reaction. It tells you whether it's endothermic or exothermic. It tells you whether it's gonna be fast or slow. It's gonna tell you how many steps are in the reaction, okay? So when you have a one-step reaction like this, that's what we're gonna talk about in section 6.2, okay? So the other thing I wanted to draw your attention to is that Nucleophiles are Lewis spaces, okay? We're gonna use that a lot. Nucleophiles are Lewis spaces, okay? Electrophile are Lewis acids. We're gonna use that a lot in section 6.2. So make sure you get that straight in your head because I'm gonna use the probably Lewis acid, electrophile uh, or Lewis space nucleophile a lot. And the fact of the matter is that that's what's gonna be driving our reactions all through this chapter, okay? And the last thing I want you to remember is, where is it? Where is it? <clears throat> that we have this stability in carbocation and it's not mystical, it's not mythical, it's, there's a reason for it. So we're looking for a tertiary carbocation if all possible. If you have a secondary carbocation, it will try to rearrange. But if you already have a tertiary uh, carbocation, it will not rearrange. So the stability of the carbocation is very important for that next section. Okay, so to finish out this section here, we need to talk about bond dissociation energy. With bond dissociation energy, it's basically the delta H or enthalpy of a bond breaking. And it generally represents that when we have a, a, a homolytic cleavage. So when each part takes away a, an electron. Okay, so that bond association energy is the energy change going from having a bond to not having a bond, okay? The stronger the bond, the harder it is to break it apart, okay? So the higher that delta H is, the more energy it took to break that bond, okay? So the idea here is that as your bond length increases also, that uh, bond association energy becomes weaker it becomes smaller because it's e when they're already far apart, it's easier just to pull them a little bit more apart. So you're gonna see several things affect this. You're gonna see uh, the, the shorter bonds, less polar bonds can be, have higher bond dissociation energies. Your very long bonds or very polar bonds can have very low bond dissociation. Why do we care about bond dissociation energy? It gives us a way to say it, which product is gonna be formed. In the reaction, you're going to form the, um, the product most of the time that has the stronger bond. Okay. So when we think about this, the entire delta H of the reaction is going to be the sum of all the bonds that have been broken, and that has a positive value to them. And we're going to add to that all the bonds that were formed. And that's gonna be that same energy for, the, the, for that bond, but it's gonna have a negative value. So if you think about it here, our bonds being broken took energy. And so you dumped energy into that to break it apart. When our bombs formed, they are more stable and release energy. They release heat. So bonds forming have our negative value, our negative delta H is releasing heat. Our positive value is absorbing heat to get to that higher energy state. Okay, so how do we use this to our advantage? 
Well, by just knowing the general trends on the different bond association energies from things, you can watch the say, okay, let's say we had uh, something like, um, let's do red right here. Let's say we had an alkyl halide here. This is an iodine, right? Notice it has a very small bond association energy. Okay, 222 kcals per mole. Okay, so that's one of the lowest numbers here on the chart. It's low because it has a very polar bond and it has a very long bond, right? So this is gonna be a lower energy to take that bond apart. Okay, let's go about over here. Remember when we did acids and bases, when we had the hydrogen on a methyl group, that was had a pKa of 50 or 55 or sometimes 60, right? So that means it's a very hard to get off hydrogen. And it also has a very strong bond. It's all over almost twice of that of this bond here, okay? Which means things with lower bond association energies right here, lower bond association energies are going to be more reactive because it's easier to break that bond. Okay, so knowing the general trends of bond association energies and knowing that the product you form is going to be of a higher bond association energy is telling you something about how the reaction is going to progress. You're going to try to always go from a lower bond energy and in reaction to a higher bond energy, if at all possible. And we'll see that again and again when we go through the next chapter 6.2. Okay. So any questions on bond association energy before we move to uh, the next section. Okay, then I'm going to leave that and pull this one up here. Now, 6.2, we're going to talk about a specific type of reaction. And right now I'm just going to call it an SN2 reaction. And we're going to talk about those reactions as they relate to alkyl halides. Okay, so we learned that alkyl halides are just any kind of carbon chain with an, with an alkyl of, with a halide on it, chlorine, fluorine, uh, bromine, or iodine. Okay, so those are the things we're going to be looking for in here. Okay, so the first thing we need to think about in these reactions is we're actually going to use a nucleophile, a Lewis base, and we're going to substitute something on that compound. Now, in the case of alkyl halides, we're always going to substitute the halide. Okay, so we're going to look for a nucleophile to substitute a halide in these reactions. So we call it a nucleophilic substitution reaction. Okay. They always involve a competition between a pair of Lewis bases and, um, uh, and or acids, okay? So let's think about that. Remember, a nucleophile is a Lewis base. An electrophile is a Lewis acid. When you go to the other side of the reaction, you've now swapped positions. One is going to be the Lewis acid and one is gonna be the conjugate base, okay? So let's look at this reaction on the bottom here. In this case here, it's easy to identify the nucleophile because it usually has a negative charge or at least a lone pair of electrons, okay? So you can always, you know, oh, look, negative charge. Uh, it's, that's my nucleophile. I'm gonna go ahead and jump there. Now, the electrophile, if it has a positive charge on it, like a carbocation, is very easy to recognize, right? But if it doesn't have a charge, look for the polar bond, okay? Look for the polar bond, the bond between carbon and something more electronegative. If it's more electronegative, it's going to pull electron density toward that more electronegative, leaving the carbon partially positive. That's why it's the electrophile. It's got that polarized bond and that partially positive charge on carbon. Okay, so now your nucleophile with its lone pair of electrons or its negative charge knows exactly where to attack the carbon because it knows that it has a polar bond and it has a group that will leave, it will be substituted. So we're gonna call that the leaving group and we're gonna identify all these different species, okay? So um, we always need to have the leaving group be a less strong base or a more stable ion than the attacking group, but we'll talk about that in a minute, okay? So almost all of these substitution reactions are in equilibrium because now you're on this side, this is actually can act as a nucleophile. It's got a negative charge, okay? So it can act as a nucleophile pushing the reaction back. But in most cases, they tend to go 
mostly to the product we want. Although we can force it backwards if we like put it a high concentration of this, we can actually change the equilibrium of your action. But most of the time it will go in the direction of your more stable bond. In this case, a carbon oxygen bond is more stable than that carbon bromine bond. Okay, has more bond association energy. Okay, so let's look at the terminology. In every single one of these reactions, we're gonna have something on the reactant side. One of them is gonna be either have a lone pair or a negative charge, that's our nuclear form. Then the other thing is what we call our substrate, okay? That's the carbon thing that has a leaving group on it. The leaving group is the thing that is going to be displaced by the nucleophile, okay? So that's really the important part here. And this is a heterolysis. The two electrons that are making the, uh, the carbon halogen bond leave with the halogen. The two electrons that are coming on with the nucleophile is either the negative charge or the lone pair, make the new bond with the substrate, the carbon bond, okay? So the electrons from the nucleophile make the new bond to carbon. The electrons that were between the carbon and the leaving group leave with the leaving group. So we follow the electrons. All right, questions about that? I'm gonna go through each of these one by one. So the next thing we need to talk about is the nucleophile. The nucleophile is always a Lewis base. It either has a lone pair or a negative charge, okay? So, and they are always electron rich. Like if a negative charge on carbon, that would be a really good nucleophile because it has a full negative charge. We can also look at the lone pairs on water as being the nucleophilic part of that. So we need to think about those as just positively charged loving and typically having those lone pairs or negative charge. The next thing we need to think about is our electrophile. Now, again, if it has a positive charge on it, it's easy to spot. If it doesn't have a positive charge on it, look for the polar bond. The polar bond is gonna tell you exactly which carbon that is going to react with, okay? So uh, these will react with things with lone pairs and or negative charge, okay? And when they do, the lone pair or negative charge of the nucleophile is going to create your new sigma bond and the bond between those two electrons are gonna leave with your leaving group if they, from the starting material. Okay. So let's talk about leaving group, okay? Another thing that drives it between the total energy of the bond, of the, of the total energy of all the bonds in the system is that the leaving group typically leaves as a stable, a weakly basic or ion or a stable ion, okay? So we're looking at halogens, right? We call that a weak base, right? Because HCl was a strong acid, which makes chloride ion a weak base, okay? So that's why we have to really know, know that correlation there. So that means that our uh, leaving group is a weak base and hopefully our nucleophile is either a stronger nucleophile or stronger base than the leaving group. Okay, so questions on each of these different components within our SN2 reaction. I'm going to talk about SN2 by itself. All right, then let's go this. Okay, so the S is for substitution, the end is for nucleophilic, two stands for bimolecular. Okay, what that means is you have to have your substrate, your alkyl halide, and your nucleophile present at your transition state, okay? You must have both of them there together because you're forming one bond while breaking another. And so it happens in a single step, okay? So what does that mean? Well, that means that if you double the concentration of one of the components, but not the other, the rate's gonna double because you have twice as much of that reacting substrate, in this case, the methyl chloride here, it'll double the reaction rate because you have more of those molecules available to be hit by the nucleophile. Now, if you just double the nucleophile and keep it the same, it again doubles the rate because you have more nucleophile hitting as many of the molecules as it can find to create our product, okay? If you double both of them, it actually quadruples the rate 
because one's doubling the rate, the other's doubling the rate, the entire thing quadruples in rate. Okay. So what that means is both the concentration of the substrate, alkyl halide, and the nucleophile are important in the rate of the reaction. Okay. So in our rate of our reaction, it's going to be equal to some constant, and it's different for every reaction. We have to measure it. And we look at the concentration of those two species. Now, in this case here, we call it an ov overall a second order reaction. What that means is you have a, a factor of one here and a factor of one here, an exponent of one, add those together and you have an exponent of two. Um, what if you tripled the rate? To triple the rate, you would have to in double the reactant of one and only increase it by 50% uh, of the other, and then you can get a triple rate. Each individual, each individual component would increase it to some extent. Now, I had a question in the chat there. Okay, so the reaction must be bimolecular because both of those things are in there. And so that tells us a lot about the reaction rate and it tells us a lot about what the reaction diagram is gonna be. If the reaction diagram says that we have to have both of these together, it means we're gonna have a single transition state and a single, from our starting materials to our products and a single transition state. So our SN2 reaction diagrams are always gonna have a single transition state or a single hop. Okay. So let's talk about that in a different way, okay. Because it happens in one step, because we only have one hump on our reaction diagram, we call the reaction concerted, meaning we're breaking a bond and forming bond at the exact same time. Okay, So we have a substitution reaction with a nucleophile, and it has to have both materials there at the same time, giving us our SN2 reaction. And that general reaction looks like our nucleophile comes in, and then our leaving group leaves and we have our new sigma bond and our hopefully weaker base or weaker nucleophile. Now, we just did stereochemistry, right? Okay. The pro well, one of the interesting things about an SN2 reaction is because you're breaking a bond and forming bonds at the same time, you must form the bond 180 degrees away from the breaking bond, right? because you're having the electrons come in on this side and then the electrons leave on that side. So it comes in at 180 degrees. What does that mean? Well, that means it's going to invert the three things that are still attached to that carbon. So you can imagine it's like an umbrella. When, you're leaving, when your nucleophile comes in here, create your new bond, it flips over like an umbrella and it changes that configuration. So, when you have something like this, we need to pay attention. If you have a chiral carbon, you're going to see a change in that chirality. Okay. If you don't have a chiral carbon, it doesn't matter. It just shows you where it happens. Okay. But the importance here is that you are having your nucleophile come in at 180 degrees from your leading group. That's the big important part here. Okay. So what affects the rate of this concerted reaction? We already know that concentration affects it because of the rate law, right? Well, we have to think about why. And the, the reason why is how frequently do the molecules collide with each other, okay? You have molecule and solution, molecule and solution. They're being solidated, they're moving around, and then they have to come close enough to each other to say, hey, I'm a negative charge, you're a partially positive charge. I think we can you know, make a new bond here, okay? So there has to be the frequency. So that's where concentration comes in, okay? Now, you also have the fraction of molecules that are colliding that have enough energy to overcome that activation energy. So you have to have enough heat or enough, uh, or a low enough activation energy to have enough molecules to say, hey, I can actually come in here and push past all this electron density and start uh, reacting with this molecule to form my new bond and then have our leaving group leave. So that's a factor. But the other thing is that I can have enough energy and I can be close to the molecule, but if I'm not 180 degrees away from the leaving group, I can't make that reaction happen. Okay, so let's go about and talk about each of these different factors and how they look at things. Okay, so the first thing we have to think about is if you have some big bulky groups on your carbon there, 
it's going to have a very small window for that nucleophile to come in and be 180 degrees away from your leaving group. Okay. So if you have those bigger groups, then you have to have a lot more energy. You have to have a higher activation energy to get it to come in and start forming that. So let's look at our uh, just general theme here. We have our nucleophile here, negative charge, lots of lone pairs coming in on 180 degrees from our leaving group here, going through our transition state. Remember, transition state is just this transitory moment in time where we're breaking a bond and making a bond. And now we have a weak nucleophile over here and we have our new bond. But notice what happened to the configuration. Our configuration is now inverted. Okay, so the idea here is that all molecules are trying to repel each other because they all they see is the electron clouds of the other molecule nearby. Okay, that's why those inner inter, uh, intramolecular interactions are so important. That dipole dipole, that hydrogen bonding, that's what's pulling the things together and giving them their uh, thing. So you can think that okay, it's starting. I'm trying to repel these things away, but I have enough energy that I can get in close enough. And if I get in close enough, I can start forming that new bond. So you have to overcome that repulsion and you have to be coming in at the exact right angle, okay? So the first thing we have to do is have enough energy to come in and uh, start to push past all that, uh, all that electronegativity, I'm sorry, uh, all that uh, negative charge and get to start, get to that transition state, okay? So the next thing we have to worry about, oh, so, and this is where temperature comes in. When we looked at this last time, we saw that just by raising the temperature 10 degrees, we can increase the fraction of molecules that have enough energy to overcome that electron-electron repulsion, okay? So we just said like this was about 50 degrees C, and then this was 60 degrees C. And we saw that there's a much higher fraction of molecules that are above the activation energy, okay? So that's where it comes in. That's where that fraction of collisions that have enough energy comes in because of the heat we're adding, okay? But the number of molecules that actually hit is actually very small. Don't worry, I'm not gonna make you calculate this. Let's say for this reaction right here, we're gonna run it at uh, 298 degrees K, which is, zero degrees C. And we're going to say the reaction is, you know, 75 uh, kilojoules per mole is the activation energy. We do some calculations and that means that our frequency of hitting things are seven times 10 to the negative 14, which means only seven collisions in every 10 trillion have sufficient energy to react. Okay. Now, so to have this be any appreciable rate, that means they must be doing 10 trillion collisions in a matter of seconds to be able to continue to make product at a useful rate. Okay. Now, just by increasing the temperature 10 degrees, we've gone to a frequency factor of two to the uh, 13th, which is about um, 220, 210 collisions per 10 trillion. Okay, so it's a factor of three. It's, it's a whole bunch higher. So what that means is that that increase in temperature increases the frequency of collisions that have enough energy. And as T increases, so does the frequency of collisions. Okay, so just colliding is important because colliding tells you that you have nucleophile and electrophile in the same place at the same time. Having enough energy so that they can do that, that's the second part of the puzzle. But there's a third part of the puzzle, okay? And that is orientation, okay? And that's where sterics come in, okay? So if you have bigger, bulkier groups around your, uh, the 180 degrees from where your leaving group is, that ability to come in at that angle or repel all the electrons that are nearby, that becomes what we call our steric factor. Okay. So in chemistry, uh, in organic chemistry, we're going to look for uh, electronic factors where are we making good bonds? Are we making, uh, do we have a good nuclear bond? And steric factors. Is this group just too big to react? Okay. 
if it gets bigger and bigger and bigger, you're going to have fewer collisions that are at the right angle. Fewer collisions at the right angle slows the rate down. So sterics will slow the reading down. So having smaller unhindered like primaries are going to go a lot faster because there's fewer things reacting, uh, fewer things to get in the way of the reaction happening. Okay, so there is a there is a way to calculate that, um, and it's similar to the reactions we were talking about before. It's kind of a rearrangement of the reading this equation. Again, uh, this is just for your uh, to know that it does exist. It's not something I made up, uh, but don't worry, I'm not going to make you calculate. Okay, so but what that equation kind of boils down to is this diagram. Okay, so let's say I'm this nucleophile here and I'm coming in, I have enough energy, I have enough heat, and I'm just coming at it in completely the wrong angle. So that collision does not yield product. Okay, so because this is, this one does not yield product, it's a high energy interaction because we're completely, we're butting into our electron clouds, but it doesn't yield product. Okay, so that means that doesn't go. Okay, so let's say, okay, I'm another different one and I have enough energy and I'm coming in and I'm overcoming all of that electron repulsion, but I'm not exactly in the right place. So that's also another higher energy output and doesn't create product. Okay, so now let's say I'm nucleophile number three here. I have everything I need. I have enough energy I have enough heat and I'm in the exact right position to be 180 degrees away from my leaving group. And that's gonna be our lowest energy because as we push back here, we start forming our bond. And what that looks like graphically is, this is the transition state right here that we see in our um, reaction diagram, but only the one that's coming in at this angle does produce product because these two are just butting into electron clouds and not forming a product, okay? So, well, these can come in at any angle possible. There's only gonna be a, a window of opportunity. And that window of opportunity is gonna depend on the size of our different reactants, okay? So if we're coming in at just the right angle, we get just the right product, okay? So again, this is because we have to have both of those molecules in the same place at the same time. Okay, so let's look at everything that's happening in that transition state, okay? We have to have the electrons from our nucleophile push past all of the sterics of all the other things and start to bond to the 180 degrees from your leaving group. So that gives us our transition state here. So we have electrons on here. Now, technically there are 10 electrons around carbon, but what do we know? That that's not a real octet, that's not a real molecule. It's a transition state, okay? It's a very high energy state and it's going to get out of there as quickly as possible, okay? And so it does that by having the electrons leave with the group that can more, hand, more stabilize that negative charge, which is the weaker base or the weaker nucleophile. And then we formed our new single bond. Okay. All right. So let's talk about that in a transition state sense. Okay. So when we look at that in a transition state sense, we have our Lewis space. We have to add heat to the system to get it to be able to get to enough energy and enough collisions to be at the right angle. And so this is our activation energy. And then when we degrade down the products, we'll end up hopefully with a stronger bond that has given off free energy and heat. And because we only have one hump, it's called a concerted reaction. It happens all at the same time. Questions on that? Okay. okay. All right, so because of this 180 degree attack, we always have inversion of stereocenters. Okay, so if you had, in this case, we have three different groups here, we are going to have to form an inversion. Imagine that flipping the umbrella backwards and we will see that always in an SN2 reaction. It's unique to an SN2 reaction because you are bond breaking and bond making at the exact same time. So those three groups just have to flip over 
to the other side of the carbon. Okay, so this is demonstrated here. We can actually take an R2 uh, bromal octane right here. It's optically pure, meaning we only have one of those isomers. We can attack it with the uh, sulfur right here as our nucleophile. And sulfur is a good nucleophile, and we'll learn about strength of nucleophiles and trends there. I'm going to go through that inversion set, and we're going to end up with the 2S oct octane thiol. Note that sulfur and bromine are both still higher in atomic number than either of the carbons, so it still counts as our highest one. So if we knew it was R before, we know our product's going to be S because we must invert the stereo center. Okay, and it would give us that. Now, there, yeah, I'll, no, I'm gonna compare that later. Okay, questions on inversion of stereocenter. Okay, it kind of makes sense. You know, if you've got a former on this side and break it on this side, it's gotta invert the stereocenter. Okay, and we can demonstrate that in a bunch of different ways. One of the good ways to do it is to actually do the reaction on a ring, okay? Because you don't have to worry about flipping around to uh, get out of order, I mean, get out of um, uh, uh, configuration, we can see on this case here, when we have our nucleophile come in here, we have in this case our cis methyl bromocyclopentane. And we end up with the inversion center going here and giving us our trans. Uh, uh, derivative of that because we had to have the sulfur come in from the bottom side of the ring to create that new bond. So it's sometimes easier to see in rings, but it's sometimes harder to see in rings. But um, you'll see that if you had a, a cis configuration, you're going to end up with trans configuration. If you had a trans configuration, you're going to end up with a cis configuration. And for the puzzled faces there, you know, remember that cis is there on the same side of the ring here. Trans is there on the opposite side of the ring. Okay. All right, and this is really easy to demonstrate with a Fisher projection, because when we do our Fisher projection correctly, remember everything uh, going horizontal is coming out at us. Everything that's in the line is either in the plane or going down, okay? When we do that inversion, all we have to do is say, well, okay, this was our leaving group here, which means the attacking group coming in has to be on the opposite side. And therefore we draw it, like if we drew the mirror image and replaced it where it was, that's where it's gonna end up. But be careful. In this case here, we have a chlorine and a bromine right here and reacting it with a single nucleophile, replacing it, each of them. Each center is inverted, but what do we have now? We now have a mirror plane because we've replaced two different groups with the exact same group. Therefore, we have a meso compound. But the stereo center is still flipped. We have two S is now a two R. We had a four R is now a four S, but we have a meso compound. So if we, instead of having two different groups to replace, we only replaced one of them, what we'll see is just an inversion of that single stereo center. Notice this other stereo center did not change because we only invert the stereo center where you do the reaction, okay? So you can also, when, if you know, knew your uh, RS before the reaction, you should just invert it in the following part of the reaction. Questions on that? Okay, so when we write these mechanisms, when we want to show that you have an S and two mechanism, we're gonna push arrows around, right? And so we're gonna start with something that's R, nucleophile, and it usually has a negative charge or those um, electrons. So you wanna put that partial negative charge or that full negative charge on the nucleophile. Then for your substrate, you wanna find that polar bond and you wanna put your partial charges on those right there. Now you know exactly where it's gonna be. There can be a hundred other carbons on your molecule, but if this is the most polar, bond and has the highest positive charge, the nucleophile is going to favor attacking that species, okay? So we're gonna draw our electrons coming in, making our new bond and having our R, and I'm gonna do it over here, nucleophile, and our I, 
with all its lone pairs and its negative charge. So we need to show that flow of electrons. We need to show that those nucleophilic, the, the electron lone pair on the nucleophile makes that new sigma bond. And the, the bond that was between the carbon and the halogen is now, those electrons now reside on your halogen as a lone pair and a negative charge, okay? So that's how we would draw the mechanism of these always. Okay, questions on that? All right, let's dig a little deeper into what affects the rates of an SN2 reaction. We already saw that concentration changes it, but we also have to think about the nature of the leaving group, okay? The leaving group needs to want to be, want to leave, right? So the leaving group that gains those electrons from that bond becomes negatively charged. Therefore, you want something that can stabilize a negative charge. Imagine larger ions that can stabilize that negative charge over a greater area are going to be better leaving groups, okay? So the reaction will always proceed faster if the leaving group can accept a negative charge. Think, you know, halogens or other things that you normally can write it as a nice stable negative charge. The next thing that affects the rate is the reactivity of the nucleophile, okay? Since the nucleophile attacks the electrophile, it is the more reactive species, okay? So the substrate can have, you know, a, 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 is only affected by the leaving group. The nucleophile is also affecting it because it's doing most of the attack, okay? It's the one coming in and creating that new bond. Okay. The next thing that affects an SN2 reaction is solvent. Why? Well, you have something leaving as a negative charge. If your solvent can help support that, then that's great. <coughs> if your solvent can't support the nucleophile coming in or the leaving charge leaving, it's gonna slow the reaction down. Okay. So we typically do SN2 reactions in a polar kind of solvent so it can support the charge and or that leaving group that's going to leave. So the more polar solvent, the faster reaction can go. Okay. The next thing that we look at is the structure of the electrophile. Okay. Does it have some big bulky groups? If it has big bulky groups, that's going to be harder to attack at the right angle. Okay. So steric interactions become a big deal. Okay is, you know, how polar is the bond between the leaving group and the carbon? The more polar that bond is, the more likely it is to be attacked. And so we're looking for also the size of the nucleophile. If the nucleophile is too big and you have something big on your substrate, the reaction rate is gonna be very, very slow because getting them into that transition state is gonna be difficult. So usually sterically unhindered, like primaries and secondaries, react much more fat, much more readily, much faster than if you have other things. Okay. And what we'll learn is that um, tertiary alkyl halides hardly ever do the SN2 reaction because of sterics. So let's talk about the nature of the leaving group. Okay, the best leaving groups are those that form stable ions or neutral molecules after they depart. So imagine having a protonated hydronium, you know, uh, oxonium ion there, and when it leaves, it leaves this neutral water, that makes it a good leaving group. Think of stable ions like bromine, chlorine, iodine, that are big and fluffy and can stabilize that charge. But notice I didn't say fluorine there. Fluorine actually, because it's a very small negative charge, it's not as good a leaving group as the chlorine and the bromine and the iodine. And we'll see that trend, okay? The, all, the other thing is the stability of the ions is also related to the um, conjugate base, the idea of how strong an acid it was. And so that means our leaving group, our conjugate base is going to be directly related to that. So if we have a very strong acid, we have a very weak conjugate base, which makes it a very good leaving group. If you had a very weak acid and you are trying to turn that into an anion, it's going to have a very high basicity and it's going to be a bad leaving group. Okay. So a weak acid, 
uh, thinks that that's going to make it a bad leaving group, it's conjugate acid. If it was weak, if it was weak, it's going to be a bad leaving group. If it's conjugate acid, is strong, it's going to be a good leaving group. Okay. So uh, always think that it, things with low pKa's are great leaving groups because they leave a stable or weak conjugate bases. And the high pKa's are bad leaving groups. You know, we will uh, go back to your pKa chart and you'll look at the same thing. Things like hydroxide as a leaving group. Okay, that is a pKa of 15, so it's a bad leaving group. But water by itself, and it uh, is, the hydronium ion is negative 1.2, which means it's, it is a strong acid as the protonated form, which means water by itself is a good leaving group. Okay, because it's a um, weak conjugate acid, strong conjugate acid, sorry. Okay, so, I said before that when our leaving group leaves, it has a negative charge and it can act as a nucleophile, okay? That's a big thing. We have to make sure that the thing leaving is not a better nucleophile than the thing coming in, okay? If it does, it's gonna force the reaction back in the other direction. So how can we determine this? Well, we can determine that by looking at the pKa's, okay? Of the conjugate acids of our system. Okay, so in this case here, we have our um, thiolate ion here, in here, it's sulfur with one hydrogen on it, which means its conjugate acid would have been H2S. Okay, all we did was protonate it, and that's its conjugate acid. Right? On this side here, we're trying to remove OH right here, which means its conjugate acid would have been water. Okay, so if we look at the pKa from here and here, uh, we can say, okay, we'll have to uh, subtract 14 from it to see what the pKb is. I mean, subtract it from 14 to see how strong a base it is. In this case here, our, our pKa is seven. So our pKa minus four, 14 minus our pKa also is seven, which makes our pKb seven, okay? So, um, so that's not an incredibly strong base, but Let's look at what we see that for that. For hydroxide ion, we have a pKa of 15.7. So if we subtract 15.7 from 14, we get minus 1.7, okay? So minus 1.7, is that a stronger or weaker base than seven? Because we're talking pKbs now, remember? So if a pKb is a negative, that means it's a very strong base. Okay. In fact, this is a much stronger base than this. Therefore, the reaction will not progress. It's going to actually convert to the other. Even if you had some of this, the reaction would go in that direction, not go forward. So by looking at the pKa's of their conjugate acids and then converting it to pKb's, you can say which reaction is going to go. Okay. Question on that. So like we said before, when we talked about acids and bases, we're talking acids and bases here. We're talking Lewis acids and Lewis bases as well. And our driving force here is to always think the weaker acid-base pair. Okay. Here, we would have made the stronger base. And if we're making the stronger base, we've done something wrong. We have to make the weaker acid and weaker base. Okay. Sorry. Okay, so just to confirm, you said we should first look at the pKa of the conjugate acid and then use that pKa to solve for the pKb? Correct. Okay. Yeah, and uh, yeah, so yeah, it's just 14 minus the pKa. So. Okay. All right, so let's do some trending in leaving groups, okay? And we're going to start with things that can make acids, and then we're going to look at some other things as well. So let's start with these right here, and we call these the good leaving groups, okay? So the good leaving groups are things that have very strong conjugate acids, okay? So water is a good leaving group because its hydronium ion has a pKa of minus 1.7, okay? Um, the sulfate ion is a good leaving group because it had a pKa of minus three. Going all the way to iodine, notice iodine had a pKa of minus 10, 
which makes it the strongest acid, which also makes it a really good leaving group, okay? So these aren't exactly in order of leaving group. There's a couple other factors here, but the idea is that as our acidity goes up, our ability to lead goes up, okay? So that makes it a good leaving group. That's just based on acid strength and conjugate base strength. So let's look at what we call poor leaving groups, okay? Notice all these good leaving groups had pKa's that were negative. Okay. Let's look at bad leaving groups. I said fluorine ion is not as good a leaving group as the other halides, okay? Number one, it can't stabilize its charge very well, and we see that in its pKa. It has a pKa of 3.2, okay? It's a positive pKa, making it a bad leaving group. Uh, bisulfide is a bad leaving group because it has a pKa of seven, right here, it's conjugate acid does, okay? In fact, we usually use bisulfide as the nucleophile, not the leaving group, okay? Uh, cyanide ion is a bad leaving group, but it makes it a good nucleophile, hydroxide and alkoxide also. Notice all of these are positive and they're increasing in their, no, but if you protonated and now an ether or a protonated, an OH group there, that turns it into water as the leaving group and it makes it a good leaving group. So the leaving group by itself without a protonation is bad. With protonation, it actually turns into a decent leaving group. So you're making it a good leaving group by making it in a neutral leaving species, okay? There's a couple other things we have that are related to the sulfonate here that are acting as leaving groups, okay? Because it's hard to take off uh, an alcohol, you can't take off an alcohol because that would be one of these poor leaving groups. So what people do is they functionalize that alcohol with a sulf sulfonic acid. So they'll turn it into a sulfonate here and either use a toluene sulfonic acid, a methyl sulfonic acid, or a trifluoromethyl sulfonic acid. This is mesylate, tosylate, and triflate, okay? When you do that, now your leaving group is now a good leaving group because it's conjugate acid. All of these have strong conjugate acids with high pKa's. In fact, they're hidden under here, right there. All these pKa's are less than zero. And so we use this as a good way to turn an alcohol into a good leaving group by reacting with one of these sulfonic acids to make it a better leaving group. Okay. So we're gonna see that happen from time to time. Where we're gonna add these groups here. We're gonna talk about those specifically in our alcohols chapter as protecting groups. Questions on these general trends of good leaving groups versus bad leaving groups. Okay. So the first thing we look at is the acidity of the conjugate acid. But that doesn't work for everything. So we have to also look at some other factors, okay? We have to look at the nucleophilicity of the incoming ion, okay? So that nucleophilicity relates to how fast the reaction progresses, okay? So because it wants to use its electrons, it wants to uh, create that new bond, we have to look at some factors, okay? The first thing is charge. Do we have a full negative charge or are we just using lone pairs, okay? Full negative charge is going to be a better nucleophile than just the lone pairs. So it's going to have a faster reaction. We also have to look at the basicity. So that's where that pKa comes in. So the pKa of the conjugate acids, the more negative they are, the better nucleophile you have. Okay. Polarizability. Why is polarizability a factor? Well, if you have a very stable polarizable material, it might be able to come in and bounce off this molecule, but then immediately come in and uh, react with the molecule next to it. Okay. Solvent effects. How does the solvent stabilize your nucleus? Okay. Does it stabilize the nucleus? Does it make it a better charge? Is it uh, uh, transferring charge to the solvent? Those affect things. And then the substituents. If it gets big and bulky, it starts slowing down. It starts getting to be harder to make that reaction. So we have to look at the substituents on the nucleophile as well. Okay. All right, so let's go hit these each one by one so that we can get, start to think about things. Okay, let's start thinking about charge. Okay, 
a negatively charged nucleophile is always stronger than its conjugate acid, its neutral counterpart. Okay. So when we think about this, when we look at our trends, if we looked at the pKa of ammonia right here, it is going to be higher than that. Uh, yeah, it is, I mean, sorry, ammonia. And that means that this is a better nucleophile than the neutrally charged species. Notice it has a lone pair. That lone pair can act as a nucleophile, but the charged species is more, um, is stronger than it, it's, it's much, much stronger nucleophile because of that negative charge. Here we have lone pairs on the sulfur here, but the charge species is more uh, reactive. The hydroxide is more reactive than water and the alkoxide is more reactive than the base. Okay, so having a full negative charge makes it a better nucleophile. Okay. The trend in basicity. The more basic a nucleophile is, the more reactive it is, okay? We look at the pKa of an alcohol is around 16. The pKa of water is 15. The pKa of acetic acid is uh, 4.7. Alcohol by itself, the protonated one is negative uh, one, and this is negative 1.7. So these are the pKa's of the protonated species. So notice that trend follows here. This is a weaker acid, making it the strongest base. Next strongest base, next and there. So basicity is increasing and nucleophilicity is increasing. It's a better nucleophile, okay? So negative charges are more important than neutral species. More basic material are better nucleophiles than less basic materials. Okay, so that trend in basicity also applies with electronegativity. Think about the trend here. We have the pKa of this is, uh, I wanna say 50. And this for ammonia is I think 23. And then water is 15 and this is 3.4. So notice that trend in basicity also affects other anions here. So this should be a great nucleophile because it's the strongest base of the set, okay? And then this should be a great nucleophile. This is a pretty good nucleophile. This is the weakest nucleophile of the set, but it still acts as a nucleophile, it has a negative charge, and it has a positive pK of its conjugate base, okay? So because the more electronegative elements hold those non-bonding electrons tighter, it makes them less reactive. Okay. Because this is the very unstable base right here, it's going to be more reactive. All right, questions on that? We're going through a lot of these factors, and so keep, but these trends all seem to make sense with the way we're seeing them, right? They're making sense as to. Okay, now let's look at charge. Okay, I said charge on an atom. When we have that negative charge, it's always a stronger nucleophile in there. And the reason we have that is because we go from a charged species to a charged species. And that means we've just done one thing. We've made a bond and broke a bond. And we have the same number of charges we had at the beginning and the end, okay? If we have something like the lone pair on our oxygen here is gonna act as the nucleophile to create that new sigma bond right here. We're gonna, we haven't gotten rid of this. This happened all in one step, right? We broke a bond and formed a bond. So we still have that hydrogen on our OH here. And now we have two charged species. We have a positive charge and a negative charge. Because we went from a singly charged species to a singly charged species in the first one, this is a faster reaction, okay? Because we're going to two different charged species here, it is a slower reaction, okay? Now, the other thing about that is this is a stronger nucleophile because it has a negative charge. This is still a nucleophile because it has, it's a Lewis base, it has those long pairs, but it's not near as strong and therefore it goes much, much slower. 
Questions? All right, so then now we get to the sterics, okay? If the substrate itself is big and bulky, it's going to be hard to come in and have that nucleophile attack. But what if the nucleophile is big and bulky? Okay. If the nucleophile is big and bulky, you have to overcome so much more sterics as you are approaching, oops, as your big, huge um, charged species here, we have a full negative charge on oxygen, it should be a great nucleophile, right? But we can't get it close enough in that transition state to start forming our bond. And if we can't get it close enough to start forming our bond, it doesn't react and it reacts much more slowly, if at all, okay? Now let's look at if we had three hydrogens here, okay? We have a lot less steric demand. It can get a lot closer to this molecule before being repelled by the groups on the substrate. And therefore it's going to react much faster. <clears throat> okay, so one thing to keep note, this right here, this alcohol group, this is a really classic, big bulky. We call this a non-nucleophilic base because of the sterics here. It's so sterically hindered, it is no longer a nucleophile, or it's a very, very poor nucleophile. Okay. All right, steric effects, that's, uh, <clears throat> okay. So, because steric effects have actually little effect on the basicity, because that involves an actual uh, proton, we have to think about choosing a less hindered base to be the attacking species to be good nucleophile for an SN2 reaction, okay? So that means that if we had uh, the salt of methanol and the salt of T-butyl alcohol, the methanol is gonna react much faster, the T-butyl alcohol might not react at all. But because this is, the T-butyl group is not acting as a nucleophile, we can now use it as just a base. So what we'll find out in our later chapter here is that we can actually use it as a base in a reaction where we use it to pull off a proton and eliminate something, okay? So we're gonna have an elimination reaction we're gonna play with. And this happens to be a bimolecular elimination reaction. And because even though it has that negative charge, it wants to make it, it just can't get there. And so we use it as a strong base. Uh, if you drove up the temperature high enough with this reaction per sheet, you can get a little bit to react, but it's going to react very slowly. And so you'll have very little product, but you can make it go uh, in some cases. If you had a, a, a T-butyl um, group with a T-butyl with a bromide on it and this T-butyl oxide, right? What you're in, gonna end up doing is you're actually gonna use it as a base and you're gonna have a mixture of products. And the substrate's too bulky, the nucleophile's too bulky, you're gonna end up with different products and we're actually gonna talk about it in the next chapter. But you'll get a little bit, but it's gonna do some other reaction first. It's so much, it'll have an activation energy lower to do some other reaction. Okay. All right, so let's see. Um, so when attacking species acts like a nucleophile and performs that, you know, you know, so it performs, if it acts as a nucleophile, it'll do the substitution reaction. If it acts as a base, it'll actually do an elimination reaction. Okay, so <clears throat> I said polarizability. Now, what do I mean by that? The bigger and fluffier anion is, the stronger a nucleophile it will be. Okay, so let's just look at size. As we go down individual rows, if we look down the halides row, which is row seven, I'm sorry, column seven here, that iodine is much bigger than bromine and is much more polarizable. It can stabilize that negative charge, okay? So it's a better nucleophile. Then we have chlorine is a little smaller and then fluorine is the smallest of the set. As we get smaller, you get less polarizable, less ability to have the electrons shift from one side of the atom or to the other. Therefore, it becomes less nucleophilic. Now, let's go down the next row. Let's go down row uh, column six here. We have oxygen, sulfur, and selenium, okay? Now, again, their acidities change slightly because of that size, but in this case, the nucleophilicity increases more because of that polarizability being a bigger anion, okay? And likewise, if we have these, which have just lone pairs on them, 
here. Sulfur is smaller than phosphorus and therefore phosphorus would be the stronger because it has a bigger atom that can stabilize where those electrons are. They're, those electrons are further away from the center, further away from the charge balancing protons and therefore can be used as <coughs> make bonds more easily. Okay, questions. So we did charge, we did serix, we did solvent, we did polarizability. No, we didn't do solvent, did we? Okay, so solvent and polarizability actually come in a little bit together, but let's look at just the polarizability of the system. So let's say we have enough energy to get our ions to come in close proximity to form our transition state, okay? So as we do that, we can see that our fluorine right here is saying, you know, hey, I have these electrons, I hold them really tight to the center of my core, and I'm coming in and I'm trying to form this transition state, but I'd much rather keep my electrons than start to share them in the transition state. The electrons are more held tightly on the fluorine itself than going to be shared, and therefore it makes it slow down. It's not as Let's compare that with iodine. Iodine has three whole shells of electrons. We're looking at that third outer shell there, or four. No, yeah, it has four shells of electrons. And so it's big right here. And so as it gets close, it can just start to stretch those electrons out to start forming that <coughs> transition state here. Notice fluorine being so small and compact, it cannot stretch those electrons out very far from its center. Okay, iodine can stretch it out almost an entire, you know, almost half of its uh, diameter because it's so polarizable and that allows it to react faster and reacts as a stronger nuclear bond. <coughs> so does that visualization for uh, polarizability help? Just think bigger is more squeezable and can squeeze in and form that new bond. All right, so now let's take this, all of these factors and put them in a chart to give you some good trends here, okay? So because it's a balance of acidity of the conjugate base, it's a balance of the nucleophilicity, it's a balance of polarizability, et cetera, we can group them into different groups by how they reacted. So let's talk about what we call our excellent nucleophiles. These are the ones that do the reactions very fast, very cleanly, and very readily, okay? So the first thing we notice about them is they all have a negative charge, okay? And except for iodine right here, these all have positive uh, pKa's of their conjugate base acids, okay? So we have the cyanide ion, which is a good nucleophile. Think about that, that carbon has a negative charge on it. That negative charge is pretty compact and can make, wants to reach out and form a new carbon-carbon bond, okay? The sulfur is big and polarizable. The iodine is big and polarizable. This actually, if we draw the resonance structure of it, that charge is distributed over two of the three nitrogens. And so it's got a resonance structure that makes it polarizable. So these are, uh, these are all big and polarizable. This just happens to be a good nucleophile because of its pKa. Remember, if we had 14 minus nine, it makes the pKb, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, yeah, 14 minus nine makes our pKb around five, which makes it uh, a little more basic, but it's a really good one. So those are what we call our, our uh, excellent ones. If you can't see that trend in your head, just memorize that. <laughs> the next set is what we have our good nucleophiles, and we see these a lot. And we'll see that the first three are anions right here, but the next one is ammonia. Ammonia is that nitrogen with, but it has that lone pair. That lone pair is helping it be that good. And except for the halogen, they're all positive right here. And they're good nucleophiles. They react very readily. And they make it really easy to good, okay? Then our last set, we'll see some trends here. We call these fair. They will react, they'll take some time. You gotta do some special games with solvents and stuff. But chloride ion, 
acetate ion and fluoride ion. And think about this is small and not very polarizable. This is small and not very polarizable, but this is spread out over two oxygens right here. So it's not as strong an anion as the hydroxide by itself. It's spread out over more ions. The methanol and water are neutral. The lone pairs are acting as the nucleophile. And when you have those lone pairs, they are not as good a nucleophile. They still can act as nucleophiles. They're fair nucleophiles, but you might have to do something to trick them into uh, participating. So those are the groups of nucleophiles we'll be using. Our excellent ones, we use iodine and cyanide and azide quite a bit. The hydroxide and the bromide we use quite a bit. And ammonia is used a lot. And we still can use water and methanol, but we're going to use them in a different way. Okay. Questions about the trend of nucleophilicity on this chart. Okay. And these were verified by reaction rates and actually measuring them. We're not just, you know, hey, it's an acid, it should be good. Right? So these are measured. Okay, I have just a few more minutes. So we're gonna go on to solvent effects. Okay, so we have a few factors here. Um, we have, is it small enough? Does it have a negative charge or a lone pair to be, to use? And then we have to look at the leaving group. Well, the leaving group, is it good? Is it easy to displace? Is it, uh, is it stable? Okay, but Part of that comes into the fact that you have to also have a solvent in there. You're rarely going to run this without solvent. And therefore, the interaction between the nucleophile and the solvent and the leaving group and the solvent become important. Okay, so let's think about that. Okay, so in the case of some small ion like fluorine right here, fluorine is a strong hydrogen bonder with the water around it. Okay, so that means it's going to have a strong interaction with the water. It's going to be holding that water around it very, very tight. Okay, that means that entire shell of ion plus all those waters that are hydrogen bonding to it have to come in and be the nucleophile. It has to push water out of the way. It's got to push water out of the way for it to start to form our transition state. Okay, so that strong hydrogen bonding is bad for our fluorine to be nucleophile, okay? So this is what we call a protic solvent, okay? A protic solvent is a solvent that has protons that can hydrogen bond, okay? Protic solvent, protic solvent. And they're, all our, these solvents are gonna be polar because we wanna stabilize charge, right? So we have our polar uh, solvent that's gonna stabilize charges. Our protic solvent allows us to hydrogen bond. So when we hydrogen bond, that's going to make things worse for us because of that system. So in this case here, we have to peel off hydrogens to get them to react, peel off water molecules to get it to react. In the case of ionine, because the water molecules are, the charge is spread out over a much bigger area, we can have the same number of molecules around it, but guess what? they take up less space on the surface and they can slide out of the way and we can use those electrons to do. It. So in this case, the hydrogen bonding is showing us that solvent does have an effect because the solvent is always present. We don't always draw it there, but we have to think about it. So things with stronger hydrogen bonding are going to make a nucleophile less nucleophilic. So in a polar eight, protic solvent, and one with hydrogens that can hydrogen bond, it can destabilize that reaction, okay? okay? All right, so in the case of these polar protic solvents, we see it change the reactivity specifically of the halogen set. The halogen set actually changes in our system. If we have our polar protic system where we have hydrogen bonding here, that's gonna make fluoride a bad nucleophile, okay? Um, and in the case of chlorine, it's going to be not as good as bromine, not as good as making iodine our best. More polarizable, less strong hydrogen bonding, more reactive as a nucleophile, okay? Now, 
what if we have a polar solvent that doesn't have a hydrogen bonding? Hydrogen. We call those polar aprotic solvents. They don't have a hydrogen. Okay. And so when we think about protic solvents, we think about water, alcohol, acetic acid, and amines. Because all of these can hydrogen bond with some part of the molecule. Okay. If you can hydrogen bond, you are a polar protic and you're going to change that reactivity of those nucleophiles in the halogen set at least. Okay, but what would be a non protic solvent? Well, there's things without hydrogen bonding. So ethers right here, oh no. Okay, almost there. Okay, almost there. All right, in this set here, we have things without hydrogen on them, like ethers right here. But see how it's polar? We have a lone pair here. That lone pair can react, but does not hydrogen bond. Here we have a polar carbonyl group, and we have lone pair over here. We have this as a polar group. So this is DMF, dimethylformamide. It's a polar aprotic, very good solvent. This is DMSO, dimethyl sulfoxide. Again, our polarity comes from our double bond here, partially negative, partially positive. Our acetonitrile, we actually have a full, uh, uh, I think we did our formal charge calculation on here, and there's this very polar uh, bond here. We have our ether again with our lone pairs here. Acetone is because of that bond here. And then we don't use this anymore because it's actually a, a teratogen or a carcinogen. This is called hexamethylphosphoramine. It's a really polar salt. Because imagine it has a lone pair here, lone pair here, lone pair here, plus partially positive, plus partially negative right here. But so the trend you see here is this has something that can hydrogen bond. These have stuff that can't hydrogen bond. Okay. So if it can't hydrogen bond, what does that mean about the reactivity of a nucleophile? Okay. So the nucleophilicity increases down the column in a periodic table. And think about it, it's getting bigger, right? So it's getting more polarizable and it has a bigger, fluffier charge. Okay. Okay. The opposite trend is predicted by the basicity because going across the periodic table. Okay. Um, but why? Well, part of it has to do with nucleophilicity. I'm sorry, part of it has to do with polarizability, but wouldn't the stronger base react faster, even if it's not polarizable because it has that negative charge in there? Why? What, how, what stabilizes it to make those more basic species less reactive? And it comes down to solvent, okay? So in the case here, we have a charge species here. We have a negative charge on our sulfur here. We have a good leaving group here, and we want to do this reaction here. But by changing the solvent, we're going to change that rate of the reaction. Okay. So why? The solid dissolves in some kind of solvent. You have to have your solvents dissolved. And the molecules or ions are surrounded by those solvent molecules. And when they're surrounded by those solvent molecules, we call that solvated, right? It can't go into solution without having solvent molecules around. Okay. So, the generally solvation decreases the reactivity of the nucleophile by forming a shell of molecules around it. So imagine um, that you have your nice little ion here, but now you have a ball of fluff around it, making it less reactive. If you have a solvent that hydrogen bonds to there, that is a stronger bond between that anion and those hydrogens of the hydrogen bonding solvent than if you had a dipole ion interaction. And, uh, the ion hydrogen bonding interaction is stronger than the ion dipole interaction. So if the ion dipole interaction is not as strong, you have fewer of them around and it doesn't change the electrophilicity. Sorry, the nucleophilicity. It doesn't carry as much solvent along with it. Okay, so <clears throat> really small ions have to have a really tight little uh, solvent cage around them. <clears throat> Bigger ions 
are, <coughs> excuse me, have a solvent cage around them, but they have the same number of things around them, but they are, uh, they don't have to cover as much of the surface of the molecule. Okay, so what that means is that when you have something that hydrogen bonds to a system, it's going to strongly attack those um, halogens. And those solvated parts of the halogen are going to hydrogen bond around this chlorine ion. Okay. So that's actually going to help stabilize the leaving group as it's leaving. It's already associated with the solvent before it even leaves. So that's going to make it a good, uh, even better leaving group. So the larger nucleophilic atoms are polarizable and decrease the activation energy at the transition state. Those larger ones are, the smaller ones are more tightly held, have a higher activation energy in that transition state, and therefore less solvated and freer to move. Uh, for those smaller polarizable particles. Okay, how, um, I, I thought I had an image here. Okay, so <clears throat> what that tells us, okay, so we have hydrogen bonding, we have polarizability, we have the acid strength here. So in polar protic solvents, iodine is the strongest nucleophile followed by bromine, chlorine, and fluorine. Think about, they can have the same number of hydrogen bonds around them, but in iodine, they're only covering 50% of the surface. And in fluorine, they're covering 100% of the surface. <coughs> to have the same number of molecules associated around that. So that's why the larger ion here is the most reactive and the smaller ion is less reactive. However, <coughs> if you change that interaction, if you take away that hydrogen bonding, now we have a, di a, a dipole interaction with that ion. So now with a dipole interaction, we don't have that bigger cage. And now we're relying on the acidity of the system. The smaller, more tight charge is going to be more reactive. So what does that mean? That means that when we go to polar aprotic solvents, the trend goes backwards. In things like acetone or DMSO, fluoride is the stronger nucleophile because it doesn't have that huge shell of water around it. It has that hard negative charge and it reacts more rapidly. That iodine is big and polarizable and uh, it's <coughs> stabilized that negative charge more than the fluoride ion. Therefore, this fluoride ion is, doesn't, is a harder negative charge, a smaller negative charge, and is more reactive. These are getting bigger and bigger. And because there's no protic solvent around making that solvent cage, it makes them less nucleophilic. So the net result here is in polar solvents, polar protic solvents, iodine is the most, the strongest nucleophile. In polar aprotic solvents, the thing reverses. Okay. That's pretty much happens mostly in the halogen system. So you need to look at your solvent when you have a halogen in your system. If your solvent has a hydrogen bonding group on it, you know the trend is iodine best, fluorine worst. If your solvent doesn't have a hydrogen bonding proton, fluorine best, iodine worst. So that means we can actually swap out halogens by choosing the correct solvent. And I'll show you that reaction next time because it's almost 150. Okay. But ah, we can review. So SN2 reactions are nucleophilic reactions for the N, S for substitution, two for bimolecular. It involves a single transition state in our energy diagram. We need to look up uh, the leaving group. The weaker the base the leaving group is, the better. Okay, which means the stronger the conjugate acid, the better. Okay, we have to look at is it hindered? Okay, all strong unhindered bases are good nucleophiles. Okay, nice negative charge. Okay, uh, you can have hindered bases are 
or nucleotides because they just can't get into that transition state of having making and breaking. Weak polarizable bases are good nucleophiles. Less uh, polarizable bases are poor nucleophiles, things without negative charge. Okay, and then our polar protic solvent versus our aprotic solvent reverses the order of the halogen series. Okay, aprotic, fluorine's best, protic, iodine's best. All right, that's 150. Uh, if you have any questions, go ahead and stay behind. I will uh, stop recording now and you can ask questions.